This is Bear With Us Podcast. Uh, can we can we add girl? I mean, we aren't all manly like you. Okay, okay. How's this? This is Bear With Us, girl. No, no, no. More like girl. Like a glitter bear. This is Bear With Us, girl. Perfect. This is Bear With Us, girl, where we stir the honey pot with hot topics, body issues, the adult industry, fashion, news, pop culture, pup culture, and more. From the bear perspective. For and by the community. I can barely stand it. Get it? You're unbearable. <laughs> yes, that's what we have to listen to every week. <laughs> it's what we get to listen to every week, you mean. So blessed. <laughs> We have such a fun big show. Um, I can't wait to catch up with our guests. Uh, big shout out to our sponsor. Uh, the show is brought to you by Cybersocket.com, the ultimate resource for gay erotica. Now newly designed after 25 years strong. Visit Cybersocket for all of your gay erotica needs. Go to Cybersocket.com. <laughs> and we're also excited to be media partner for Bear World Magazine. Bear World Magazine is now nine years old and it's the only lifestyle magazine celebrating the global bear community in all its glorious, diverse beauty. Head over to BearWorldMag.com to check out the great Barry content and also sign up for the new Wolf Report. Woof. Their new weekly newsletter packed with Barry news and gossip. Yes. <laughs> uh, but a wolf is like a dog, so that's not a bear. I mean, none of the animals make sense in the gay community, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, I've just determined I'm a man-bear pig. A man-bear pig. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. And you know, giraffes now, they've added giraffes. So a giraffe is small, uh, the tall guys with big dicks. That's what a giraffe is supposed to be. <laughs> Did you know that? I did not know that one. It's gray sweatpants seasons for giraffes. God, you're learning new animals every single day. <laughs> All right. Do you want to introduce our guest? Because we can't waste any time today. Okay. We're going straight into this, you guys. Woo -woo. Our guest today is Johnny McGovern. And hold on one second. I have his bio. No, I don't. It's there. Oh. <laughs> Here <Sorry>. we go. <laughs> Johnny is a comedian, host, singer, and TV producer. He is the host of the long-running hit show, Hey Queen, and his new show, a reality competition show, Go Go for the Gold, premieres on Out TV this spring. Please welcome our guest, Johnny McGovern. Can I have one of my back? Yeah, you want it back? I love when people say they're a huge fan of Hey Queen and they don't know how to spell it. I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, you're a real fan. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. I have to know, knowing your journey that we've seen on camera, I wanted to know, what kind of kid were you growing up? Were you always like the class clown? Were you doing the shows? Or were you the quiet kid in the back? What oh, was going on? I mean, on? definitely, uh, you know, high class faggot. Like, you know. <laughs> like, literally, like literally high? high. <laughs> I was tall. <laughs> I, I was faggoty. I had a rat tail. I was doing the shows in school. I mean, definitely, I was just what you'd think. I didn't mean high-class faggot, but like a high <laughs> faggotry faggot. What was like one of the like biggest roles that you played in like high school drama? Oh, no one ever recovered from the drama when me as a freshman was cast in the role of Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady. The feelings <laughs> and the anger through the senior community <laughs> was just rumbling. That's impressive. Oh, I thought I it believe me. The, the VHS tape was viewed so many times by my relatives. I ate off it and lived off the memory of getting cast in that for years. Are there are there clips of this at all? Oh, they have, the, you I have mean to they're them. around. I think someone on actually on Facebook did post clips of me being like, Eliza Doolittle. <laughs> I'm sure I would play it exactly the same today. Would you ever replace the replace the role? Sure, sure. I'm sure they're dying to see my Henry. Higgins. Yeah, but add like a little drag spin to it <laughs> yeah, where you're trying to make Eliza a big right. drag queen. Yes, uh huh. That mm. that would have been good. I could have cast Lady Red in that. That would have been good. I mean, you, you know more than enough drag queens to cast for the whole stage. <laughs> yeah, for yeah, definitely, of, of definitely. Course. Now, when I first started doing musical theater as a kid, I would just emulate whatever I saw in the movies or whatever. Did you make Henry Higgins your own, or did you just recreate what you saw? Oh, it was from the a movie? full Rex Harrison like <laughs> imitation, for sure. <laughs> I've I always loved imitating. I mean, I I did watch tons of movies and TV. And when, when I lived, I lived, grew up overseas, so this was in Egypt that I was doing this production of My Fair Lady. Um, I'm with the American school in Egypt. I also lived in Thailand. Is that for real? Yeah. I did not know this. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, my mom was in charge of Asia and the South Pacific for Plant Parenthood. So we traveled all around the world. So it was very, I was very worldly. But anyway, my grandmother would 
send me VHS cassettes that she would tape on her old ass VCR player of every TV show that I wanted to see and she would cut out the commercials. Uh -huh. So I, and you didn't have anything else to watch on TV and movies there. So I would just watch these boxes of uh, VHS tapes over and over and over again with Golden Girls, 227, Amen, all that stuff, which of course, you know, bled right into my mind for the rest of my life. <laughs> I mean, that is amazing. If you're grandma, I mean, to put in the time you and effort. Go, grandma, I know. Right. I know. She was very and, supportive. She was she Henry Higgins' number one fan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did she did she know you were gay at a young age? I mean, she's sending you girl, yes. Golden Girls. Yes. Yeah. I mean, tape. yes. When I actually didn't come out to my grandmother, but later when I did come out, which was in college, um, I had come out to my parents, and then I was like, well, we should probably tell grandma and so my mother told her, and she was like, well, I listened to his voicemail message, which says you've reached Johnny McGovern, the gay pimp. <laughs> and I figured it out. I figured it out. So I didn't ever have to come out to her. <laughs> I mean, coming out by voicemail is smart. Just make your voicemail. Oh, that was great. I'm gay. It was because <laughs> I was, <laughs> at that time, about to be go on the Ricky Lake show, where I was, like, the gay one. Yeah. So... As like a panelist, not as a guest for a scandal, but as a panelist. So I was always doing gay topics. So I was like, we got to warn grandma. But honey, she knew. She knew. Now, you have always celebrated sexuality through your music, through your shows. It's nothing you've shied away from. Um, did you kind of have the sexual revolution on your own? Did, did you start? I know that you came out in college, which is a little bit later. But were you exploring your sexuality physically before that? He's basically asking, are you a slut? <laughs> oh, well, I'm definitely a slut, but I did not get to be a teen slut. I mean, growing up in Egypt yeah. just was well, not, hello. it was like going to a homophobic American school, but like add extra homophobia. So I wasn't even, I knew I was gay at that time, but there was no one to look up to or out to other than closeted high school teachers who I knew were gay, but like that, or Blanche's brother on Golden Girls. Yep. And that wasn't really <laughs> like, yeah, it wasn't exactly inspiring me to feel good about myself. So it wasn't really until I went to college when I went to acting school where everyone thought I was gay anyway. So <laughs> even the times that I told people like, I'm not gay, they were like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you are. Well, wait. You are. Your tick, best tick, acting tick. role. Yeah, exactly. Now, we're kind of uh, enjoying this uh, celebration of sexuality on a big level, like with Lil Nas X, and that's something that we've talked about. Um, you know, we've kind of recovered from a very difficult administration and uh, time of society for, for our community. Do you think that we should tone down the sexuality in any way in order to rebuild bridges or kind of reach mainstream or should we even go full force like like Lil Nas X is doing? Are you asking me, the person who <laughs> put gay music videos on the map when Lil Nas X was still like being born? A, a being born? Exactly. But the whole culture has changed and now it's like we are kind of licking our wounds so to speak. We kind of have to start mm -hmm. from we from years ago. We we lost I our I feel like you need to ask this, ask this question the one day we have like a conservative guest because he always asks this, I'm like, we always have somebody on who are like, girl, no, I want everything to be even gayer. Right. Right, but we haven't suffered as much in the last, I don't know, 15 years as we have in the last four years. Do you know what I mean? I mean, but the level of suffering doesn't determine whether we can be gayer or not. <laughs> no, but like, if we have to like tone it down so that we can rebuild bridges with people that wanted us dead Fuck Six them. months ago. Fuck, fuck them. Fuck them and fuck you the bridges. You know what? They can do what we want to do. Suck a dick. I mean, <laughs> I, I think, like, again, all the people who are pushing a conservative agenda, that is a much smaller part of the country. People are actually much more open. And as we see with Little Nas X and other pop stars being open and drag race being so huge, you know what? We need to just be us. I mean, the people who are censoring us most right now are our own community. Hmm. People, we're, we're becoming very touchy and delicate about everything. And sexuality, like, oh, that's we it's creepy. It makes me feel weird. Like, you know, there's a new owning of sexuality, which we should be doing. Well, like, think about this. Like, there's the new Gen Z that, like, we're talking about how they're like, there needs to be less nudity at Pride or people wishing to keep their shirts right. on. Snooze that alert. was like, a hot. How do you feel about that? About, Terrible. about Gen Z being very, like, for example, uh, there is a Gen Z on TikTok who said, I was at a Pride parade where a drag queen threw a condom at me. That is sexual assault and rape. Right, exactly. Please. And in a court of law, who knows how they would interpret it to make that? Well, yeah, you're right. But like, no, that is not assault. That is not rape. No, I mean, there's like a there's a lot of being What's too a condom sensitive. Anyway? Being <laughs> no one in this a room condom has at pride? ever heard of it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I think people are being too like the, there's a, a certain section that's being too precious about everything. Like get over it, gayness. Gayness is there. Is, gayness is sexuality. It's a part of our our lives and community. I don't think we should be censoring it. Because I wanted to bring my daughter to Pride. Well, I'm sure there's a kids' Pride your daughter can go to. I mean, well, there's pe- people that try and bring their kids to Folsom and then complain oh, that there's sex. That's ridiculous. And I'm literally like, you just went to a sex party and now you're saying there's sex. Right. Although, so I was raised in Orange County, which is super conservative. I didn't come out until late in college. And my, because we didn't have media the way that we do now, I won't say what year it was, but my <laughs> idea of being gay was all about butt fucking, which scared the crap out of me. Mm. Ah, uh, <laughs> because that's all I thought being gay was. And it terrified me so much to that I didn't have my first gay sexual experience until even way after I came out. And it was, it was terrifying to me. But my conservative raising up was just gay equals gay sex which if so if we're promoting the sexuality and we're celebrating the sexual at a high level is that still associating being gay means gay sex well if you're gay you're gonna have gay sex so that's just a base <laughs> hopefully that's just a baseline that you should be able to accept you don't have to be scared of it i mean a lot of my early uh material which was very sexual was because i had come into my own as a sexual person when i moved to new york i sort of transformed lost weight was found attractive by people and sort of got a boyfriend and started feeling good about myself and that was what inspired me to write those songs like soccer practice or looking cute feeling cute because i was celebrating how i was feeling in owning my own sexuality and you know that ended up inspiring like a lot of people to feel the same way to listen to the music now so how do you feel about because we're talking about like you know being gay and accepting our sexuality and like claiming our space what were your thoughts on the whole maddie morphus you know being a straight guy on drag race this season how do you feel about a straight person trying to come into our sexual realm and claim it as their space? I mean, I don't think Maddie Morvis is trying to claim it as her space. Was I thrilled and having a straight pride parade when I found <laughs> out they were going to have a straight drag queen in the workroom? No, I was not. But was I upset? No, I was not. The whole drag audience has become extremely passionate about the idea that drag is for everyone. And sorry, sweetie, you can't have it both ways. You, you Drag should be for everyone. And there's nothing that the RuPaul's Drag Race production crew likes to do than to give a little bloop back to the audience that's given them such a hard time for so many years. Is that they're like, you wanted everyone to be in drag? Well, we have a surprise for you. Welcome the first straight male <laughs> drag queen. I think that's why people got mad is because they're like, we've been begging you to allow trans um, people to compete. And the second you finally do, you're like, well, now straight guys can too. Well, you're also like- <laughs> remember, Drag Race is always trying to grab headlines. It's always trying to keep it and fresh. And it kind of has it to works. because we're in season 14 now. Yeah. And it's like, you know, how much more can you do? And it is. It's like doing drag has nothing to do. Nobody's fucking on stage. So it's like it has nothing to do with mm-hmm. what's going on. Sure. And if you want to say be inclusive, like you said, then you be inclusive. And here was the point that I wanted to make when this all came out because people were just tearing it apart and tearing this poor guy apart and the guy is like from like the midwest somewhere he's like you know there's no red lobster out here i was very upset i mean like you said he didn't have this big political agenda he just wanted to do drag it's very it's fascinating it's interesting and he's this is probably this is obviously someone who's a mega ally who's doing drag and living in the drag world it's interesting well, i'd there, be interested there, to see how it plays out well, there, there are also rumors too that he actually isn't even straight well, maybe I that'll mean, be the arc that he has his big coming out and RuPaul would, like because holds knows. him and cries. I mean, and... actually, if like who like by the way, I don't know if any of this is true, but that actually would be a smart arc to be like, you know, I've been trying to get on Drag Race, I can't get on. <gasps> I'm gonna pretend I'm straight and be the first straight contestant. I mean, it, look, it took Drag Race a little while to course correct, uh, and starting, of course, we all wanted trans women to be on the show as are they are deserved to be because they're the foundation of drag. Uh, in general, in America especially. And then, you know, they 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 took them a minute. Everybody forgets they film everything a year before yeah. anything comes out. So when there was the furor about that and people really were pushing for it, they made the change. We just didn't get to see it for, like, a whole year. Plus, the show had to become as mainstream as it did. Like, at first it was, you know, on Logo, and then it was on VH1, and now it's, like, on every streaming platform. Um, 
And I'm wondering if it had been more pro-trans before, if that kind of mainstream spotlight would have happened. And the thing about the straight guy being on is now the story is being shared even more so in straight households as, wow, even a straight guy can be accepted in this environment because it's not... Um, it's not some weird culture that we cannot take a part of. Do you of. think straight bros are now watching the show being like, wow, I'm glad that there's inclusion. No, but I think there's somebody's mom that, because it's like, oh, this straight guy's in it that thinks differently or now the language is in the household. I don't think a straight guy drinking a beer with a shotgun <laughs> is watching it, but I think the story has now... Um, is now in more homes than before because it's not just this gay and trans drag queen world anymore. Well, they've always talked about on that show, if you watch the early seasons, RuPaul sort of condescendingly refers to the audience as Betty and Joe Beer Can. And, uh, you know, I'm not <laughs> thrilled with that. Uh, but you can see they wanted it to be simple to understand at first. And then, then they got there. Then the culture shifted and they had to make big changes. And I think they did. They, you know, they always make a great show. And I'm really enjoying this season. And I I I could be I, I could watch every single one of all those uh, those shows. I watch all the different editions. Now you have a very interesting position because your show, Hey Queen, you love to spill the tea, obviously, and that's uh, fans love your show because we get to see the queens in a different light. You also ask very probing questions that are not so PC. But do you run this kind of, you know, it's a thin line between. You know, you being the host and asking these kind of edgy questions, but also still being respectful of the drag race world. Because if you ever um, are not part of that drag race world, then you are completely shut out, as we've seen from some personalities that are no longer welcome in the family. Uh, well, honey, I don't know if you saw the episode of my show where Pearl said, RuPaul said, nothing you say matters unless those cameras are rolling. I'm pretty sure the relationship <laughs> ended there. <laughs> 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 How are you feeling whenever that happened? Did your like heart just think like, of, oh no, this is about to be big? I was pretty shocked, and I was really like, "Don't talk over her. <laughs> <laughs> Let it keep going. <laughs> Don't ask any more questions. She's having a moment. Just like because a lot of times, you know, I'm trying to pull, go further, go deeper." And with that, I was like, just shut the fuck up and let this person tell their truth and let it out. Because that was at the end. That happened at the end of a look at her segment about RuPaul, which was all positive. We were about to move on. And then she said, one more thing. <laughs> and so it was gag. It was a gag for me. It was a gag for us. It was a gag for the, it was a gag. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I don't think we've really been on the good side of that of that since then, really. I've always um, looked at you as, you know, we throw the word iconic around left left and right, but I really feel that you are an iconic part of LGBTQ media. You were promoting the gay agenda, so to speak, before it was cool, before it was accepted, before it was smart as an actor, as a host, as, as a musician, as anything. And like we talked about, you were really pushing the envelope, even the big gay sketch show. You know, it was a show way ahead of its time. Mm. Um, I thought it was hilarious why it didn't get more exposure with the crew behind it, the the cast that you had on camera. It was like it was before its time. Yeah. Now that you've seen this boom with what's happening with gay Hallmark shows and left and right, it must feel a little better that you work so hard to kind of provide the foundation and now it's everywhere and you're like but i was doing it before it was cool mama i'm very very good at being early <laughs> <laughs> like i made a viral music video that got five million downloads before youtube there was no way to really monetize it yeah. other than touring the world or whatever but like what's there was that? soccer practice 2003 it was like it did that many views back then oh my god it was downloaded from i almost crashed my website it was downloaded people went to the site and downloaded Downloaded the video five million times. It was added to MTV Europe and Asia. We're playing what? it as like a yeah. regular rotation video. <laughs> I mean, I was just like a comedian living in East Village, and suddenly, like, without my knowledge, this video I kind of made as a joke was like turning me into a real pop star. So I had uh, several years of doing that. So that was early. I started my podcast, Gay Pimpin' with Johnny McGovern, mm -hmm. 2006, uh, you know, a good 18 years before. Everyone and their mother had a podcast. Then I was on Big Gay Sketch Show before yeah. that was really a thing. So, yeah, it's a real fucking pain in the ass to be so early. I'm not, then, I, of course, I uh, highlighted drag and drag queens in the talk show format yeah. many years before everybody else. And now everybody and their fucking mother is doing that it. That has to be so frustrating. But you can look at it as like, I, I know it sounds 
sad, but like, look at it as at least you are a trailblazer. Like, mm. Yeah, but it honey, doesn't pay your that. rent. There's that. <laughs> You know what I mean? But when, yes, it's sometimes it's annoying to be early because you see someone get the same success that you had with something at that time now, and then they're on Jimmy Kimmel or they're like, you know, they're making huge money from that thing because the system is set up because somebody blazed the trail. And <laughs> well, and that is the truth. But it's like okay, even if you're honored an award, you know, a trailblazer, whatever, it it does not pay the bills and what i've seen lately is people are being awarded for having a podcast or you know having a talk show and it's like a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy because it's been done it was done years ago like you said mm. and that's when it was without the corporate um tie-ins and having to be politically correct and it's like that is the product well the real reward for me is the fan base that i've grown you know like especially with the podcast there have been people who have been listening to me since 2006 who are extremely devoted and you know like teddy you know with an only fans type audience i have a patreon that i do all, all my podcasting on now and like that's the freedom thanks to that audience everybody can fuck off and i can yeah. still make these shows for this audience and live fine you know and that that is special that's the freedom you really want as an artist even if you become super rich you don't want to have to get a job <laughs> Well, you know what I mean? You don't want to have to get a job at Starbucks. You want to be able to create your art and live well and have people like it and support you. Well, that's a, and that's what I was trying to say about being a being a trailblazer is that when you are also a trailblazer, you tend to also be somebody who's capable of working on your own. Yeah. So that maybe yes, somebody else may end up doing the same thing that you did earlier, but you're going to be somebody that you can do a whole entire project yourself. You can come up with an idea of what you want to do next yourself, while somebody else usually can't even think of that idea. Well, and you you never stay in just one product. You continually um, have new iterations and spinoffs of, of your core entertainment, um, which I've always admired because you've always been ahead of the curve, and it's like you kind of know what's going to happen. But to be able to say, okay, that we had fun on that project. Now it's time to move on to this project mm -hmm. and do it 110%, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. There's so many ways and different genres of audiences that you are pulling in to your main message, which is be yourself and don't give a fuck what mm -hmm. anybody else has to say. Mm -hmm. um, such as the new show that's, that, Teddy, that, that you're on. It's <laughs> Speaking uh, of moving <laughs> on to a new project that I yeah. think is going to be huge. <laughs> what? Because you kind of told me what it was. Are, are you allowed to talk about it? I mean, yeah. I mean, we've announced the project. We're not going to spill the secrets. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, actually, 10 years ago, I created a show because one of the other things I've done all through the years was starting in New York. I used to throw parties. I used to be a party promoter, and I created some legendary New York cock. City parties. Well, the cock was one of the millions of places that I threw parties. But I had parties in New York, especially one called the Rambles at the Park, which was like a three-story building that had lines around the block for years. And then I worked in nightlife. So whenever I was doing TV stuff or whatever, I continued to throw parties all the way till till a few years of living here in LA I threw that so I work with go go boys I work with drag queens it was actually all of that influence of nightlife that you know made me want to create hey queen because it was sort of that drag influence mm -hmm. the go go boys all the voguing world all of that stuff was you know shown in hey queen so when I moved here to LA I started throwing another really go go centric party at foo bar called Saturday Night Slut. I had done other parties <laughs> yes. called like Boys Room. I'm like in a lot of, my one thing I loved at parties was having tons of go-go boys. I loved yeah. the art of go-go. The audiences liked it. I love a dirty gay party. The Cock was actually my favorite place, is my favorite bar in the world. It's a dark room with dirty go-go's. And it was such a center queens. for so many people to come out of it. Mario Diaz, yeah. Sherry Vine, I mean, Mario Diaz Jackie invented Beach. the Cock, really. Yeah. And so we're all uh, following in his wake. But I mean, that type of party was always my favorite. So at that time, uh, Greg McKeon, who's also another huge OnlyFans star, who yes. was one of my best friends, and we created a show called Go Go for the Gold, which was going to be a reality competition show for Go Go Boys. So that was like 2010. Drag Race had just started. Um, but then right after that, Hey Queen came about, and really there wasn't a home that was able to put up the right amount of money to properly do the show. I mean, I wasn't trying to make it on a dime at my house, you know what I mean? But then this last year, uh, I've been working with Out TV uh, with For Hey Queen and Look At Her for the last few years, and they were very interested in the concept. So I sort of reconfigured it for 
today because it was definitely a very 2010 treatment when we <laughs> originally did it. Um, we sort of just shook it up a little bit and sort of modernized the concept a bit. And yeah, we we pulled it together. We cast it. We shot it. And uh, because of something that happened behind the scenes with when someone had to drop out, I also have edited the entire project myself from soup to nuts oh I, I have my this Literal is a nuts. <laughs> handmade project by me and let me tell you i learned a lot in the last i the teddy the week after we stopped filming i started editing and i'm working on the last episode like you didn't, you didn't even oh wait the, right before i got here well because like when you're doing a show like this the deadline for it to be done what is december so you only have a couple months yeah. so even though we shot the show for five days just a lot to put together. And when we lost the person who was supposed to be editing it because they had a death in the family, the deadlines were looming. So I was like, I always edited all of Hey Queen, but to take on the reality project from the beginning was it's much different. definitely beast. a lot. It's a whole different bag of skills. And a lot of to respect to the editors of RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> So is it is it like American Idol for Go Go Boys? What, what kind of Go Go Boys are, are we going to be seeing? Uh, I mean, we're we cast a wide variety of Go Go Boys, all ethnicities, all body types, hairy, not hairy, skinny, chunky, muscly. <laughs> um, it's a real rainbow of talent. Uh, the the judges are called the Go Go Gods, and because I again I wasn't I stupid that. enough to be a judge on this in 2022, <laughs> Go Go Boys should be judged by other Go Go Boys. So we had a panel of all star Go Go's as the judges, and they have to compete in challenges. You know, it's a lot of a drag race type format, but with the type of challenges that you know I knew from seeing what Go Go Boys really have to go through. Um, you know, we created and made fun plays on all of that. And it's great to see, like, you know, the cast of characters is fucking wild. The show is funny. The judges and the contestants all brought the looks. It's really sexy. There's drama. There's, I mean, I did not know what to expect going into it. But as we started to shoot the show, I was like, this shit is for real. I mean, these people are really, these guys are really invested. They're really pushing. They really want to win. And we were giving away $10,000, so it wasn't Holy like shit. it was for nothing. And, and so I did the math. $10,000 is the equivalent of 100 go-go shifts. I love I love right. that math. Which is the equal to, because usually go-go dance usually like twice a week. Yeah. So that's a whole entire year's worth of gigs paid to you. There you go. And, Teddy, you and I were talking before the show of, um, you know, we've had like all this powerful activist type programming and it's like so why do we need a show like this we need a show like this because not only is it sexy and fun but it also is from what i'm understanding celebrating the diversity that exists mm -hmm. it's not we're just not seeing 10 pretty boys doing pretty boy things um it is a celebration but it's also a time where we can sit back and be like yeah i like well, to look at guys in underwear no now you just that like i my biggest issue i've had from go go dancing is go go dancers rarely get respect drag queens now finally do things to like drag race and more exposure but go-go dancers, especially when it comes to payment, they're more just like, oh, well, you should just be grateful you're getting tips. You're just, all you're doing is just you're, you're just in your underwear. That's all you're doing. And that's not the reality anymore. And it's that's, working out how many hours a day. There's just so, there's a lot to it. And the thing is, like, go-go dancers in certain bars here in West Hollywood get paid shit. And I'm hoping that, like, a show like this can start making that go-go's are respected and they deserve to start getting paid more. Well, if you've ever gone into a nightclub and seen someone who's really good at being a go-go boy and yeah. uh, i don't mean just getting naked or whatever like right. who can shake that ass and flirts with the customers and makes people feel special and does all that it's very similar to the same way that drag queens were the star of nightclubs the other star of our queer spaces are the go-go <clears throat> boy and knowing for so many years so many amazing wild crazy great personality different look go-go boys i knew it was so much potential to have a show where they would compete together and really blow it up. And the show is delivering. I mean, the shit is really good. And I think it's going to make the this cast into their own go-go superstars who will be able to travel the world, and then we can open it up and find yeah. more. And, and, start, and they can start getting paid be, more for gigs. Right, exactly. Like and did. it's like a and whole... And one's going to pick it up, and then NBC's going to pick it up. I don't know about NBC. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually, the other thing is, is that you'd think that a show about go-go boys is some kind of 
something that a Gen Z type audience would be like, oh, it's too creepy, it's too sexual, it's too whatever. It's actually one of the most wholesome motherfucking shows yeah. that I've ever done. Like the emotions are real, the characters are real, the no one's being judged on their body really. It's on the art of how they perform and how they are as a performer. Though there's plenty of eye candy <laughs> and tiny outfits and slings and sling, all sorts of outfits that these guys bring are incredible. But it really goes to show, shows like a lot more depth than you might expect. And it's funny as fuck. When does it premiere? We're not sure yet. They're giving us either March or April is the oh, date. I mean, we... honey, I'm literally, I just came from I know you're finishing like, can I get a finale. break? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like editing the finale right now. But I'm thrilled with how it turned out. Teddy Bear brought it as a judge. Always Teddy Bear it. would always, um, he would wear an outfit that had a thing that he would want to showcase, and then he would do it. So one day he wore uh, like a red light, green light type outfit that said stop on the hand. And he made sure that when the person who was not eliminated was leaving to Tyra style, go stop and hold up his stop sign hand. <laughs> So that he could do that last little comment. Well, I had to bring it because, like, I was so I was the go-go god of um, personality, individuality, individuality. Teddy. Um, sorry. Well, <laughs> first, I originally wanted to be the god of fur, but that couldn't that wasn't going to be claimed. Mm -hmm. um, but no, like these go-go dancers, like they brought it, and I literally was watching them. Like they were dancing, they're doing all this stuff, and I, in my head, I'm thinking, I'm like, God, if they come to one of my go-go gigs, I don't do that. I don't do these splits. I don't do these backflips. I'm like, shit. I was intimidated by them. Yeah, but every, everybody has their, but, their niche. Exactly. And from right. being involved in the nightlife, we also learn real fast who the professionals in the business are mm. and who are the go-go boys that show up late, they show up <laughs> drunk, they show up, they're just awful to work with. Um, Have you ever met a go-go that's like that? <laughs> <laughs> But it's the same with the drag world, and it sets the professionals and the long-lasting go-go boys away from the fly-by-night go-go boys who then yeah. think that they're famous or they're insta-famous because, I mean, they literally get on a box, and then they're horrified. They're like, what do I do? They're like, I'm famous because I got a free pair of Andrew Christian briefs. <laughs> right. I mean, you also get to see the different go-go boys of different types. Some go-go yeah. boys aren't like about dancing and doing mm -hmm. drops or whatever. They're like, you know, they get called the two steppers by some of the more dancer ones. <laughs> so there's a little bit of, in, you know, back and forth go-go shade going on too. It's really fun. Lot The judges are great. The judges each have sort of a speciality. So there's the God of individuality, the God of body, the God of fantasy, and the God of... What's the other one, Teddy? I'm forgetting. See, you're judging me for forgetting. And it's your own damn I mean, show. You were, you were the, you were the, you were the judge of God of individuality, <laughs> Teddy. Anyway, they each have a speciality, and they, uh, they, you know, you don't have to necessarily do all the things to be able to judge a performer. And all these guys have really had a lot of history in nightlife, and they they were able to judge correctly. Well, and that, I think that's what I liked. About the God of dance, of course. Yeah. How could I forget it? <laughs> no, but like that's what I also loved about like. It literally is not just about who's the hottest because that's not yeah. what. Because we know nobody wants to see that show. But we not don't want to see. But we not don't want to see people getting judged for their looks. But yep. you know, the hotness is part of it. But you'll see a wide variety. And of, what you respond to as hot, yeah, it's, exactly. it, it's different. Well, exactly. And also, just being like hot thought doesn't guarantee a long go go career. So you have to be more than just that. It's because there's 10 quality. guys that can do that mm, right after yeah. you're gone. It has to be a little bit more. Um, Johnny, on the show, we we. We talk about everything, but All we, right. we talk about I know I'm a the reality, I the reality of life, and um, Teddy and I have talked about it, especially during COVID. It's been a lot of smoke and mirrors. Depression has hit mm -hmm. a large part of the community, um, and I know during COVID, uh, huge loss. Of course, we lost Lady Red, um, and I don't know if you want to talk about it or not. But having to kind of work through that grief. Um, losing somebody so important to your life at mm. such a weird time. Yeah. What I loved is that you shared the beautiful aspects on social media so that mm. fans were able to grieve along with you. Um, and the way that you honored her was was tearfully so beautiful. Mm. But as a performer that people expect the Johnny McGovern to show up and, and you know be the life of the party, how do you kind of work how did you work through that grief? How do you continue to work through that mm. grief and continue the party to be able to go back to set, um, I mean, even to wake up? <laughs> yeah, it was fucking brutal, man. It was brutal. I mean, Lady Red dying was a huge shock. You know, she did have a chronic disease, but it never thought she was going to die. It happened very suddenly. You know, she wasn't speaking to her family, so I had to, like, call her family and talk to her them. The audience was shocked. I was shocked. It rocked my world completely. And uh, 
And it was extremely difficult to get through, really, really difficult. Not only because I was not just dealing with my emotions, but wanting to set the audience up to be able to grieve with me and to be able to celebrate her, but not in an exploitative way. Right. And to, you know, I, I've never had someone so close to me die uh, so suddenly and then have such a public reaction. I mean, and there was also a lot of, you know, you know, right when she died, she was covered by every magazine, New York Times, Essence, uh, you know, every big magazine. And, you know, a little bit was like, where the fuck were y'all motherfuckers before she died? You know, she mm -hmm. could have used some of this attention yeah. then. Um, so I had to work through a lot of those feelings. Um, and then I had to go back to work. See, we I owed the network the hardest, 26 the episodes that we had just started filming. And when you're running an independent operation like Hey Queen, there it was either like, do you want to fulfill this order and continue with the show, or do you want to just give up and quit? And how long do they give you to even grieve? I mean, I w I had like a month that I I it took two months away where I needed to where I went away. I went to the woods. I visited friends, and then I had to go back and figure out how I was going to continue doing the show to meet the commitments that we had signed contracts for, which was not really what I wanted to do necessarily, but I knew that Lady Red would want me to continue and that she would, she was always someone who picked her shit up and she moved forward through whatever pain she was having, which is why she was such a great friend and great co-host. You know, no matter what was going on in her personal life, she could put it on for the camera. And I also wanted to, you know, I didn't want to just have it end there, everything that we had worked together so long to build. Um, luckily, I had two of my best friends, Adam Joseph and Erica Tor. They moved back to L.A. for the months that we were filming and became what we called on the show my emotional support orchestra, which allowed me to figure out a way to have fun while doing it. And to be honest, doing the season, because we, so, we talked so much about her and we paid tribute to her in so many different ways and we talked to all the guests about her, um, that helped me to process everything because... It wasn't like we had just, like, she died and we pretended she wasn't yeah. there. You know what I mean? Like, she died and we talked about her the whole season. And, of course, the internet always has something to say in one way or another. Like, why are they always talking about Lady Red? Well, because she had just died when we filmed it, okay? Um, but that did help me process the, the whole thing because it was very cathartic. And then by the time that we that was finished, we were then releasing everything. I also recorded an EP called songs to lady red yeah. which was really cathartic and like was really not for anyone else you know she and i used to listen to like lo-fi music to to relax to and so i wrote these three songs and it's really different than anything i would ever done it was pretty sad one was called uh flowers because really after she died like there was this thing like i wish she had gotten her flowers before because people have such an outpouring of love. And this is a woman who struggled in a lot of ways. You know, people knew her on from Hey Queen, um, where of course we were all smiles and everything was great. But, you know, Hey Queen's not a multi billion dollar operation where we were all rich. She was still working and struggling. And, you know, when I first met her, you know, I was taking her to like the supermarket to apply for jobs where she was not getting jobs at Subway because she was trans, you know. And so even as her fame grew, there were still a lot of struggles that she was going through on a personal basis and with her health. And, you know, she really could have used some of those flowers before she died. And so that was something I had to deal with emotionally to process that those kind of angry feelings. And writing the songs helped. And it just was a very emotional process. And it, it again, was another thing that helped me get through that because, yeah, it was a lot. I mean, I'm still dealing with it today. I can imagine, and it is an important point that our community does need to do things not after the fact. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think I don't know if I was joking with you, but you know, Bob Saget died, and everybody was weeping and wailing. It's like, when was the last time you paid to go see his show? When was the last time you bought any of his comedy uh, tracks, or did you even know what he was doing? And it was like this after the fact. It's like, no, 
let's be there during, such as, you know, we just celebrated Martin Luther King Day and everybody was posting away. And it's like, well, what did you do? Did you call your senators and talk about, you know, the the voting uh, election and, mm-hmm. and all of that? What are you doing on a daily basis? And for our people in our community that are suffering, then let's be there in, in other ways as, as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of hard sometimes to look at, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that the trans contestants are on Drag Race now. And the spirit of Lady Red is very alive. She knew cornbread, and the, you see a lot of that bread. type of you see a lot of Lady Red type of energy yes. in her, and I yes. love that. And you know, I, it's she spent so many years trying to get on Drag Race and not getting on, and it was like God, she just missed this opportunity because she would have won Queen of the Universe. Yeah. I mean, she could have really slayed on that. So, so I mean, you would say she's a trailblazer too, or she definitely doing it before you know, others. She definitely was because of hey queen she was out there and yeah. proud and trans and 100 percent herself i mean talking about not letting people be sensitive lady red wasn't having any of that you know yeah. what i mean she was very out front with her sexuality with her gender identity and playing with that as well you know she wasn't and she wasn't precious about it you know, she, for many years she just called herself a full-time drag queen <laughs> you know later she sort of evolved her you know her her self-description and to be, you know, becoming a trans woman and being very, very proud of that and helping inspire so many other people. But yeah, you know, it's a process, man. It's, it's, it's still difficult. But, you know, it's one of those things I knew Lady Red would want me to keep yeah. doing things and keep moving on. And, you know, that's, that's what I'm doing. It doesn't make it any easier, but yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again for, for sharing that. Um, let's kind of sh- shift topics. I know we wanted to bring this up. It's like, how much wokeness is too much woke? Uh huh. Um, and we're talking about the reboot of right. so Sex we, and the City. <laughs> so we've been talking uh-huh, about the reboot of Sex uh-huh, and City. Yes, uh, sweetie. Have you watched it? Oh, I'm on my Patreon, which is <laughs> patreoncom gays of all time. We're doing a full watch along where we watch and comment on every episode. So I got to ask you about the they who sh- shall not be named. Uh huh. She Diaz. She's here. <laughs> They're here. <laughs> They're here. <laughs> They're here. <laughs> Would would you, with a gun to your head, listen to their podcast? I mean, that is one of the travesties of the new show is that as someone who's been podcasting for many years, that J podcast is so bad. It's their, so horrible. It's their full-time job where you're like, you're getting right. paid for that? Exactly, in the skyscraper building. <laughs> and why is J... Not vaping weed. Why is Che lighting up? A, is it the 90s? Are we on the Lower East Side of the 90s that Che is at every event holding a pulling bomb? Out a, like a metal pipe and packing it? Like Che obviously seems like a modern person who's a, a star with, as we learned in one of the episodes, 347,000 Instagram followers. Yes. I'm pretty sure Che would have a vape sponsorship and wouldn't have to always make such a scene when she pulls out her bowl <laughs> and lights it up and ashes it ever. How rude. Oh, and the number one Netflix comedy special. Right. I well, mean, that I, was another really painful. I was like, girl. Moment. As a as a queer comedian, I was like, mm, well, And for a school me. fundraiser, they're going to get somebody like Che to come perform. Like, come on. No, the character is needs work. Work. <laughs> but I mean, t- the whole the whole whole show does because the whole show is trying so hard because it's trying to make up for what it did wrong in its beginning seasons. Because before it was the show was offensive, it a biracial trans time, it, it was it was fine for for what it was. Um, I mean, I watched a Christopher Guest movie last night, Mighty Wind, and one of the characters uh, decides he wants to be a woman at the end, and it's it's so inappropriate. But for that time and for that storytelling, it it fit what was happening. I loved the original Sex in the City. I you know was went through my I was having sex in the city at the same mm-hmm. time that it was on. I loved it. I thought it was a great show with great performances. It's a sitcom. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't very realistic of New York City, which where I was living. <laughs> but the conversations the were kind of what we were but having. Though. It was a fun sitcom. It can't be everything to everyone, and yeah. so they have come in trying to fix, to flog themselves, to fix everything. And some of it I enjoyed. Like I know that everybody had a real problem when we found out that our precious Miranda was now sort of a clueless no, Karen, I love that. and she was made everyone cringe. But I thought that was great. It happens in real life, though, right? The women of Sex yes. and City at this yes. age Would might be doing that. that. Yes. So I think we're going through a lot. We're going through a ring, the ringer 
with the girls. <laughs> We're also going through the ringer as they learn and grow. And sometimes it's not as fun as we want it to be. Because sometimes I'm like, can we just have fun, girls? Girls, can we have fun? Do we have to have another lesson? But, you know, it's only been like a few episodes, like five episodes. The last few six have episodes. started That's to- That's a lot of six. episodes. The, but <laughs> the last few have been start. We're looking at this long-term teddy bear. We want more seasons of the girls. I don't we think it's want- going to happen, by the way. Oh, I think it is. I don't All the so. conversation has stopped about a season two. Yeah, that's because they have to say they're not going to have a season two to do penance for the truth about Mr. Big. Where <laughs> they can't be dancing on the grave of Mr. Big too quick talking about season two. They're just going to let it play out. I know we're going to see another season. The fashion's been top notch. I think the, the new yeah. cast members are great. LTW is a perfect addition to the cast. Um, you know, some of it feels a little shoehorned in, mm -hmm. but I'm still, I'm still, every time I watch, thrilled to be with the girls. We're with the girls. They're different. Some of them have had face work that we don't really approve of. And, you know. I, I love that part whenever Carrie um, pretends to, to go for her appointment to talk about Botox for the first time. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to believe that SJP has never had any that work That scene done. was hilarious when he was like, oh, you? And she was like, what? I, I mean, I enjoyed that because we would freeze frame and be like, what has she had <laughs> yeah. done? But I mean, they all she look- looks very natural to me. She looks very natural, very beautiful. I'm not going to say the same for Charlotte. It was an issue for the whole first few episodes. I just kept looking and be like, why would you ruin your beautiful face so with this filler? I have a friend that um, he is a like, plastic surgeon, and he had a whole entire podcast dedicated to what she did with her face <laughs> wrong and what she should have done. Oh, I am in. Please <laughs> let me know. And he looked like I, zooms I, in, dissects, I, and shows you like mm, she filled instead of lifted. Uh -huh. and. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know in this room, it's you know, it's a very delicate dance for lady stars yep. and their work, and even more delicate dance for men stars. I don't want to see my man stars with like uh, Kenny Rogers. Oh. I mean, <laughs> never from here up, don't do it. Yeah. You know, I'd rather look crusty than look like I had bad surgery. I think I mean? Steve looks good. In Steve this. looks natural, but yeah. unfortunately, Steve, what? <laughs> what? They've I made didn't like Steve, that storyline. Like, he used to be the hot Steve, husband. He was so sexy. When yeah. did he become like Popeye's oh, grandpa? <laughs> I'd still blow him. I'm sorry. Yeah, I still of course him. you would, Teddy. He has an only. It's all he's after Miranda. He's going to get an OnlyFans. And <laughs> yeah. you guys are going to collab. Gonna pay for it. But Charlotte's husband has aged hair. I even texted oh, yeah, you. He, I said the men look awful. Yeah, the men, all, all of them, even poor Mario. I, I never, he's had too much. Work. I never liked Harry on the show. Yeah, I don't think anybody has. But you prepared me for it to be some super super woke show, and I was prepared to hate it. I even got my wine, like we talked about. I don't know. And how I you was like drawn it. in, and I was like, okay, another episode. And then when it said no more episodes left, I was like, it it won me over. And the woke parts right. weren't so woke that I was turned off. They're doing their best, you know. We as the as the side of good are very hard on each other and our projects. And it's like Harry Bradshaw must have extremely muscular shoulders because the weight of every community is on <laughs> her. Everybody want, has something that they want from that show, and they're trying really hard to please everyone. And it's interesting. I, I listen to the podcast that the writers do, yeah. and I think that's also very interesting. Now, do the, do the writers know, like, have they said anything about the feedback to the show? Like, are they admitting they know yeah. that people hate like Che Diaz or yeah, hate the they're, show. They're, you know what they're it's doing everywhere. in a very 2020 move? They're having trauma about it too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they're also traumatized like anyone who's public figure on the internet by the cr cruel reaction to people <laughs> for the show. And I think the lead actresses are surprised that it wasn't accepted so openly. I think they're like, oh crap, we actually have to work but, hard now. But you guys, we added people of every yeah. race. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't that what you said we did wrong? Yeah. Well, we now we hair. have something new we're mad about. <laughs> you didn't do it good enough, girls. <laughs> but I did like how it depicted Carrie when in Sex and the original you know she was the top writer and she was on mm. the word on the mouse of, of everybody was talking about Carrie Bradshaw in the city and now we see her struggling to be a good podcaster we see that she's not at the height because books are not doing what struggling. books are doing we, we saw her in a I mean, brand new not home not financially not okay. financially because we <laughs> right. know Mr. Big had money because mm. everybody's been asking where does this bitch have money from she's buying and selling properties left and right she has sushi every goddamn why night do you, why do you think she let him die and she's like she literally was like she I'm put not the Peloton the on times yep. 10 or whatever I mean, like, I'm not calling the cops. Right. I want that insurance policy. But I do like that there is that kind of part of her career that she's not the toast of the town right now. And she's having to kind of 
figure that like releasing a new book and it's not what she's comfortable with and like they went to auction her off and like nobody really wanted her yeah i like seeing that and we get to remember that carrie bradshaw is a narcissistic selfish <laughs> bitch a lot of the time and we can aren't enjoy we ourselves being like carrie you're a selfish <laughs> bitch no like, aren't we, we know we know why samantha does not reply to your message <laughs> right i uh, love uh, her the, text. the ghost of samantha <laughs> yeah texting. i mean i i thoroughly enjoy it as much as i have to say about it which is a lot and i think everyone does i'm happy to see that cast back and you can't deny the fashion is off the hook and there are episodes of golden girls that are so woke like the aids episode and the brother coming out and then like the death and the poverty well, episode well, you know and it's like it's so ridiculous but we still love it they're the same age as the golden girls you know that yeah so no. It, yes. The, well, I the mean, the Golden Girls were younger. The Golden like, Girls by one year. The Golden oh, Girls all yeah. were, other than B, they were all lying that they were in their early fifties, where they were really in their early sixties. But the characters were all fifty-one or so, right? Yeah, fifty-one to fifty-four, right? And Sex in the City is fifty-four to fifty-five, is right. what they're but doing. But in real life, looks wise, B, Betty, and uh. Estelle. Estelle were in their early 60s. Okay. So they and were Estelle, playing young. I mean, thank God. As I edge toward my 50s, I'm happy to see that we're not still living Golden Girl style. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that I that's can, the assumption. That I can be a beautiful, natural carry, a hairy carry. That's me. <laughs> I mean, I want to say no to the shoulder pads. I think I, I, mean, I think I could pull that off. Teddy bear, you, you have built-in shoulder pads. Oh, <laughs> Golden Girls, look. Oh, what teddy bear, please. Call, call, call me Bear teddy, Arthur. Right. Mm. <laughs> Oh, I see what you did there. Mm. Mah, mah, mah. Ma. <laughs> and of course, they released Golden Palace on Hulu. And it's like, no, don't. To remind you yeah. that that is the and just like that. Oh, too. my right. God. You, yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly. That's exactly. Funny. And I just like that is, is way too. better than Golden Palace, which was terrible. And I love the Golden Girls. Oh, God, Golden Palace was so bad. And poor Don Cheadle so was like, bad. what am I doing here? And Cheech, never and forget. Cheech? Never forget Cheech. And the Cheech. kid. There is one. It, since it's on Hulu now, go back to the one or two episodes where Dorothy does come back. Two episodes, and it's arc. like yep. seeing a Golden Girls episode that we you missed because <laughs> it, it, it is good. Is. It's just as good. And the reviews I remember at the time because they reprinted the reviews and they said that it's only it's saved when B. Arthur comes back. Okay, well, so speaking of that B. Arthur moment, mm -hmm. do you think Kim Cadrell will come back? Mm, very doubtful, I think, but. Who knows? I would pull if I was them. I would pull up the Brinks truck and give her what she wanted. Give her but executive I mean, producer. She doesn't have to even be in the scene. She could have a scene wherever she's at. Like right. we're seeing her participate in the show through what, have through her coming other on, means. Coming, coming on a Zoom call. Right. No, not even communicating with them, but to know that she is still being affected by their lives across the pond. We could see her in her new life on her own, respond to something, or for her to see the text on her side and for her to look at a picture of them on her desk and then the doorbell rings and yeah. it's her mail. Seat. I don't think we're ever going to get that. <laughs> I wish yeah. I would love it. It's like a charm it. when Shannon Doherty wouldn't would come back for the end. I would love it. But I think like when you send those tweets like she did where she was like, when is that whole, my mother mm -hmm. says, when is that horrible woman going to finally leave us alone? I don't think we've we're all had see. heated moments though. We've all had fights with people that we are able to work with later. I would love it. I mean, look, I'm, I'm give her whatever she wants. All the other girls got to be executive producers and got to direct and whatever else. But and she's going to be on the new Queer as Folk, so her career is going to be like Boop, with the gays. Yeah, I don't. They need her. But that's the thing is, I don't think she needs a show. She's on that. She's on How I Met Your Father, and yeah. she's on another show, yeah. and has a movie coming out. It would be great. I'm sure she's like. If you think I'm getting naked again and starving myself and riding <laughs> dicks like I did before, you know maybe she'll see this and want to come back. I don't know. I doubt it, but I would love it. On that note, another show has come and gone. <laughs> oh yeah, we're done. Yes. I mean, well, we can we can finish up. Johnny, can you tell everybody where you want them to find you and follow yes. and give your Patreon again? Oh, I mean, the most important thing, darling. Go <laughs> to patreon.com slash gayest of all time. That is where I'm podcasting up to three times a week. That's I do great. all the entire cast of all the people that I did my podcast with over the years on Gay Pimpin' and Gayest of All Time all join me for individually for different shows. Um, we do watch-alongs with things like Sex in the City. We do a show called Menergy, which is all about gay culture and looking back. We, I mean, it's really fun. So that's where you'll find me. 
and the best way to like you know with an only fans you if you really want to get someone's attention go behind the paywall yep. because me and my patreon people or like this <laughs> of course you can find hey queen tv on youtube there's eight seasons worth of uh delightful homosexual content and uh you know check out my new TikTok hit man areas from ten years ago suddenly <laughs> going a viral hit with the kids on and TikTok. the straights the straights love it Johnny are you single I am okay all right put that out there too we'll see you on Grinder right. you will you will <laughs> on that woof report <laughs> right and me Teddy Bear you can find me on Instagram at Mr Teddy Bear Gur that's Gur with two R's. And you can find me on Instagram at Alexander is on air. Um, yes. <laughs> also, send us your questions. We love reading your emails. Send us an email at bear with us girl, and that's three uh, R's at gmail.com. Um, and show us some love because we are growing this podcast and uh, and we love we love doing it. Because you never know what's going to happen every episode. Got so many R's in mine, one R in yours, yeah, three R's in girls. And I'm Spanish, so we have a lot of R's. <laughs> girl. Girl. I, I, I'm the only Mexican that can't roll R's. Embarrassment of my family. Well, for many reasons. Wow. But still, yeah. Be ashamed. Yeah, I am the shame. Uh, on that note, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. That has been another episode of Bear With Us, Girl, presented by Bear World Magazine and Cybersocket.com. Please take a moment to like, subscribe, comment, rate, all the love and support you can give, guys. Questions, comments, and suggestions? Email us at bearwithusgirl, three R's, at gmail.com. Until next time. Embrace the fur. Grrr.